Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Troy Moley, and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Glad you could be here with us for our first show of October. Hope your month is off to a great start. And beginning the broadcast, corn fields are drying down and some producers may notice patches of plants showing discoloration or dying early. This could be a symptom of stalk rot. Market Journal's Bill Dodd recently caught up with Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara jackson Zims to find out why it's crucial to scout fields and distinguish which ones should take priority when it comes time to harvest. Harvest season is officially here. However, before you get into the fields to get your corn, you should consider checking the stock quality of your crop in order to prioritize which fields are picked first. And what happens though in many cases is where you have a lot of ponding earlier in the season, we may see some nitrogen loss or nitrogen deficiency uh, you may see that in the field in any ca either case, too, if we had a lot of rain in general. And so uh, later on, if it, was, if it was actually drought that caused those problems, it might be different stalk rot disease. We have seen some charcoal rot, for instance. We see that usually on drier knobs or in the dryland corners of fields. This is especially important that people watch those fields that were under stress earlier in the season especially where they had a lot of leaf diseases. And southern rust was a big problem for a lot of our state this year. And southern rust is notorious for having secondary stalk rot problems later on. And so I would especially get out, check those fields, and especially go out and do a push or pinch test. And so literally pushing those plants at arm's length, at least 100 plants, and keeping track of which ones bend below the ear and that'll give you an idea of which ones may be weaker and those fields might be the ones you'd want to harvest first or even earlier. It may be too late to utilize any spray treatments. However, it is very important to know which stock rot diseases are in your field. Doing so now could help you make some valuable decisions a little further down the road. But it's all hollowed out in the middle. And so if they're finding a lot of it, it would be worth your time to focus on areas of the field where you may have seen plants die early. Uh, those can be in areas where maybe you had some ponding from some earlier storms, or it may be in some drought stressed areas, or where you've had a lot of individual plants dying, or what we call ghosting, where they very suddenly turn a grayish green and die. That can be a stalk rot issue and so I would recommend taking a shovel and digging the entire plant and splitting it carefully with a knife because you can see in the, in the stalk where you might see problems whether it was a top dieback issue or the actual problem is sometimes in the crown below ground and you won't know that until you split that open and so that would be something to know and hybrid selection can often help you reduce the incidence of some of those problems and of course like we try to do routinely every year trying to reduce overall stress which is uh, often unavoidable. Another problem to consider with stock rot is the issue of stock lodging. This could cause yield loss as well as create difficulties with volunteer corn in the following season. However, there is some promising data that shows fungicide application near tasseling could be beneficial to reducing these problems. We now have data showing that foliar fungicides used around tasseling or shortly thereafter can reduce the incidence of stalk lodging, but much of those effects may differ by hybrid. Some of them are going to respond differently than others, and so that might be a good conversation to have with your seed company representative. If you do suspect stock rot early on, you may notice some leaf death, but may have to take a bit of a wait-and-see approach. Unfortunately, having those leaves analyzed wouldn't do much good in identifying stock rot as the problem will only be identifiable in the stock or the roots. You may see firing back, we call it, or uh, desiccation, some dead leaves. And if you collect leaves at that point and send them, say, to a diagnostic clinic, there's no pathogen in the leaves. The actual problem occurred in the stalk and sometimes in the crown and roots below it 
because once those start to rot, they start moving water up. And even if water is available, the plant is not able to access it. And so in that case, the plant dies often very quickly and it's difficult to know why. The second part of that might be that sometimes conditions in the field or agronomic practices might actually impact it too. So if you have compaction in the field, and you'll figure that out when you're trying to dig those roots in to look at their shape. And so having them flatten off at the bottom will show you may have some compaction. That can lead to some, uh, some of those symptoms too. I mean, it's it's important to make note when you begin seeing signs of stock rot, as the time of year this begins to take hold on a crop greatly impacts the effect it may have on the overall yield. Stock rot can affect yield if those plants are killed prematurely. And so it really matters when in the season they become affected by this and when you see some of those plants dying. In some cases, uh, we become worried because if you have a high incidence, of course, of stalk rot, you can see some lodging if we have high wind events. And that's happened to us the last few years. And so it's, it's worth going out and seeing how bad it is in those fields, whether or not you have an issue. Bottom line, Identifying the fields that have the highest rate of stock rot and adjusting your harvest plans accordingly can help minimize any potential losses as a result of the disease. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. When submitting samples to the UNL Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic, be sure to include stalks and crowns. Further information on submitting quality samples can be found on the PPDC website you can also find the information on the Market Journal website. Next up, 13 is the lucky number when it comes to soybeans. That percentage is the optimum moisture content for the crop come harvest time. Going above 13% means a dock at the elevator, while falling below means drier beans and a smaller yield. And since it can be really tough to get that 13% exactly right, you can take a little bit of dockage and still be better off. And the reason why is when beans get overly dry, they can shatter and shatter losses alone, three to four beans per square foot is a bushel per acre loss. Shatter is a big issue, but you're also getting paid on less bushels at eight or 9%. It's ingrained in our head that we don't ever want to dock. But what happens is as beans dry to 12, 11, nine and 8%, we are losing far more in water weight than if we would have been delivering those beans at 14 or 14 and a half percent. But we really need to be a little more aggressive in Nebraska and not worried about, oh, I got a dockage here at 14 and a half percent. But let's take a little closer look at what happens when we're delivering at nine, 10, 11 percent plus the shatter. So if you're delivering soybeans at 10 percent moisture, that's 3.3% uh, yield loss. Uh, if you're delivering beans at 9% moisture, that's a 4.4% yield loss. Compare that with your elevator's pricing strategies above 13% for dockage. And that isn't even in taking into account shatter loss. Fortunately, new technology allows for producers to monitor moisture changes and to make adjustments. Some of the new grain bins have moisture sensors that can be mounted at different areas in the bin. And if you uh, pay for the app uh, right to your cell phone, we didn't used to have that technology years ago. So you can, you can really manage soybeans that are overly dry. We call that reconditioning, uh, where aeration fans are on when there's higher humidity and that sort of thing. But um, uh, there's moisture sensors right on modern combines, so growers know right where, where they're at pretty accurately on the go. But there's things that can be done in advance of harvest too to, uh, for combines to a little more aggressively handle that uh, above 13% without slugging. And so if you've ever slugged a combine, that is a terrible thing to have to do. <laughs> so there's some, there's some certain, certain things that uh, growers can do. On the Market Journal website, we've posted some links to help optimize soybean harvest and adjustments to the combine that you might want to make. Moving on to the cattle markets now, and the latest cattle on feed report released late last month showed feedlot placements over 9% higher than during the same time last year. The reported number of cattle on feed for September 1st was 11.4 million. That's almost 4% above a year ago, and the largest September 1st total 
since the series began in 1996. Mike Briggs over at Briggs Feed Yard joined me this week to run through the numbers and talk about what he's watching in the cattle markets. Well, it was interesting. That was kind of a bearish cattle on feed report, but the, the market just completely shrugged it off. It opened a little bit lower on Monday like they thought, but it didn't go quite down as much as they had thought, and it just ground itself higher, so the market pretty much shrugged it off. Now, the things I would pull from that, of course, the marketing number was a little bit short, but there also was one less marketing day, so our marketing was actually pretty good. Uh, the placement thing, there's a lot of bits and pieces to that. You're starting to see a growing drought in the West and it's growing towards us. It's been very dry here. So you're gonna see a lot more cattle come to feed yards earlier than they typically would have. And you can kind of see that in the placement weight data. So yeah, there's a lot of cattle on feed right now. So guys gotta be really careful here because it looks like we're starting our fall rally. And I think it's gonna give guys opportunities to lock in some profits. I think that would be a really smart thing to do because that report showed us that we're never going to get away from cattle. We're not going to run out of cattle anytime soon. So what does that say to you about the beef industry and the beef producer as a whole that even with COVID, even with packing closures, even with other market disruptions, things are still just chugging along? That's a great question. You've got a little thing going on in the cattle industry right now. You've had some bigger feed yards get even bigger yet. So they have a lot of bunk space they need to cover to make that thing turn. And so I think you've, you're seeing people buying cattle just so they can receive the yardage. And that's a problem because that means they're gonna buy them with no margin left in them. Now, having said that, we had opportunity to buy cattle with margin through July and part of August. So that was the reason for a lot of placements also. It was just interesting that as many cattle were available as were, but part of that's this growing drought, I believe. But you've seen a lot of, and if you look at the numbers, Kansas is stuffed full of cattle. You've seen a massive build on in Kansas, and there's been a massive flood of cattle into Kansas, and that's because of the bad winters we've had the previous three years. And so people are afraid of the winters up here in the north. Hopefully this year, because of the drought, we're gonna at least have a dry winter and so it won't affect our performance quite so much. And I wanna get a word in about boxed beef. So take me through what you're seeing with boxed beef. On one end, you've got retail demand. On the other end, of course, you've got restaurant demand. And you know we've lost a lot of that restaurant trade due to COVID, but it seems like retail trade is still looking pretty good. So how big of a shift is that from what we'd normally see this time of year? You know, that's a really good question. Most of your meat always moves through retail, but yeah, there's a large percentage or there was a growing percentage that went through food service, which has dramatically shrunk. And you're seeing more and more of it go back to the retail case where people are buying and eating at home. And until we can get control of COVID, it's gonna to continue to be that way. The great thing I read the other day on a report about all this was 61% of the of the purchasing dollars went towards beef. So people are gravitating towards beef, even though pork is almost free and chicken is fairly cheap, people are buying a lot of beef. So it's been a great deal for us from that standpoint. Obviously COVID is not good for anybody, but the fact that the consumer is going back to beef, relearning how to prepare beef in the home, I think is long-term fantastic. Box beef, now typically what you have this time of year is you rally into Labor Day, and then this thing just can't hardly get to the bottom fast enough to rebuild demand because beef is your or Labor Day is your last big beef holiday. But this year we just took a couple of steps back, and then it's right back at it. A lot of that is due to exports. Exports are really good right now. That's because of the lower dollar and because of the trade agreements that we've made. And so. Exports and domestic demand is really, really good right now, and that's that's a great thing for us. Yeah, and harvest is moving along well too. Anything you're watching in the corn market? You know, this corn market got out of hand really fast when the Chinese started to buy corn, but I think that's a more of a short-term deal. There's still gonna be a lot of corn out here. I think when we really get into gut slot of harvest, we're gonna back this corn off even more than what we already have. The, the idea of having sub $3 corn, though, I believe that's gone, but 
I still think there's 30 or 40 cents down in the corn yet because we still have a two plus billion bushel carry out and that's a lot of corn. So we can't get it too high because we've got us to keep demand stimulated to use that. Ethanol margins are poor. So still the biggest plant in Nebraska has remained closed for several months. And I've heard nothing about the Columbus, the ADM plant in Columbus opening up. So if you don't see good ethanol margins so that there's demand from the ethanol companies, I think that's going to be a problem. Thanks again to Mike. Next week, Darren Newsom will join us for a look at the grain markets. Moving on, and generations of Nebraska farmers and ranchers used red cedar trees for everything from fence posts to windbreaks. But as the years went on, the eastern red cedar grew a little too well to the point where its encroachment on forests and grasslands has taken a toll on land values and pasture production capabilities. According to Nebraska Extension's Cat Caswell, an eastern red cedar population of around 250 trees per acre can cut forage production in half. I spoke with Cat about the tree's economical impacts and ways producers can manage it. There's one, there's the financial hit to just the individual producers themselves. Um, if they have to find additional land, if they have to maybe take some land of CRP in order to graze it. And we also kind of see these big region-wide uh, impacts across the state. We've lost more than half a million acres of grazing land to the East Red Cedar trees, which is roughly lost about $18.7 million in grazing. Um, estimates have said if the trees continue to expand, we'll lose about $360 million annually just in the grazing possibilities from the lands. And there's also a lot of those costs that we can't really quantify. So we're losing ground to endangered species, we're losing water resources, um, things that's difficult for us to measure. So it's not just one producer's taking a hit, we're going to see a big area across the Great Plains take a hit. Sure, that makes sense, just the ecosystem in general, yeah. So as far as identification of eastern red cedar, if I'm a producer and I wanna know if that's anywhere on my land, what do I need to be looking for? So they are evergreen trees, um, but they don't look like those pine trees that we kind of think of. They don't have needles like our Christmas trees. They are junipers, so they kind of look like hemlocks or like if you've seen a juniper bush. Um, so they have little scaly leaves. Um, they're not super big trees. They only get about 20 to 50 feet tall and just a single stem at the bottom so they don't branch off multiple places. And they produce little blue, they look like little blue fleshy berries, but those are actually the cones. Um, so if you pull those apart, all the little seeds are in there. In terms of management, does the height of the trees determine the best way to manage them? Yeah, so the smallest trees are definitely the easiest way to manage them. Um, it's pretty easy when they're, when they're around two to, feet, two to three feet tall. Um, I kind of say around the height of a yucca plant or the height of your kind of average border collie is a big as, about as big as you want to get them. Um, once they start getting bigger, so two to 10 feet, you can use herbicides on them. It's more of a spot treatment just to make sure there's enough chemical on the tree to actually kill it. Um, the bigger the tree gets, the less effective the herbicide is. And then once trees kind of get over 10 feet, that's where a lot of our really difficult management comes in. So we're looking at chainsaws and skid steers and bulldozers. And a lot of times that's where it gets really expensive. Um, so we're getting reports that it can cost up to $150 per acre. So if you have a thousand acres, that's easily $150,000 or more just to get one portion of your grazing lands under control. Uh, probably the most effective way to control them when they're over that 10 foot size is with prescribed burns, which will cost you about $10 per acre. Any other pros or cons with prescribed burning? Yeah, so burning is great. Um, because it is a part of the natural prairie ecosystem. So a lot of times it's really effective. It has over 80% control of those trees. It's fairly quick, it's fairly time efficient. A burn will only take a morning or an afternoon. On the downside, um, while it is quick itself, it takes a lot more planning time than some of our mechanical controls. You can't just go out and do it. You have to write a burn plan, you have to have a crew that communicates well and knows the burn plan, and you also need a burn permit. And in order to burn, you do need to defer that land from grazing for a full season ahead of time, just to make sure there's enough uh, fuel there for the fire to move through. And then you can't graze that land for at least a full grazing season afterwards, just to make sure we have enough forage return and we don't cause erosion issues. And then herbicides are an option too? 
Yeah, so herbicides are a great tool if you want to do just a couple of trees, if they're spot effect, uh, to do some spot treatments. They can be really effective if you're following the labeled rates and applying enough product. You can have really good control of the trees. Um, the problem is they can get kind of expensive if you're trying to manage some larger trees and a lot of them. So some herbicides can cost you about $20 per acre. So it's effective if you have a small acreage and just a couple of trees that may be a little bit past uh, cutting size but they can get expensive on some larger acreages. Cat stresses with eastern red cedar, it's best to be proactive rather than reactive. Getting ahead of an invasion can save you lots of time and money in the long run. Next up, raising 290 to 300 bushel per acre corn in a rain-fed environment is no small feat, even in a single year. Marvin and Glenn Wiles, who farm near Plattsmouth, have reached this milestone several times. For instance, in 2014, they broke 350 bushels, taking first place in the no-till, non-irrigated category in the National Corn Growers Association's Yield Contest. For the Wiles brothers, higher yielding corn is a perpetual build, and it's just part of the formula for higher profitability. Read about the Wiles strategies for higher yielding corn, marketing, and workflow management at harvest in the October Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Al, what's the big weather story for the week? Well, Troy, it's been a very dry week, and that seems to be the pattern that we've been on through this entire fall period and late summer. And of course, the drought has expanded. I encourage you to see the latest drought monitor in regards to that. We've actually seen drought expand into southeastern Nebraska. We had that hard freeze conditions across much of the northern portions of the state as we were going into yesterday morning. And now we are basically looking at another dry stretch ahead of us. So not a lot to offer in terms of opportunities for precipitation. However, when it comes to harvest activity weather, I don't think we could ask much but better deal. So let's get to the upper air pattern and see how this week is gonna progress as we go through this next seven day period. As you can see from today's upper air chart, we have a trough that is responsible for bringing the cold air into our region that's over the Western Great Lakes. We expect that that's going to lift somewhat toward the Northeast. We have cool conditions that are gonna remain in place across the state. There is even a chance for some scattered shower activity across Eastern Nebraska, even though it's not showing anything here on the moisture, there is that outside chance we'll see a few light showers. But more importantly, that trough lifts a little bit toward the Northeast, brings a little bit warmer area into our region for tomorrow. We should be a rebound in temperatures back up into the lower 70s as we get into the Southern side of that high pressure system. And most of the precipitation remains over the Southern Great Lakes region. As we go into Monday, yet another little wave moving in Northwest flow kind of clips the Northern Plains region. That'll bring a slight shift in our winds, but we should still see temperatures that will be primarily in the upper 60s to low 70s. No precipitation in sight, most of that confined to the eastern seaboard. And then as we get into Tuesday, another piece of energy tries to move through that trough. This will be our last shot of uh, frost temperature or frosty conditions across the state. If it does occur, it's going to occur Wednesday morning. But that low pressure up in the Arrowhead region will keep the moisture up in Minnesota. Looks like a dry funnel boundary passage for us. And those cool conditions will basically remain just to the east of us. So if this backs up a little bit, we'll see some frost in eastern Nebraska. But more importantly, we start to get into a very warm trend after we see this last blast of cool conditions coming in. High pressure over the central United States, precipitation over the Great Lakes, dry conditions and warming as region starts to build in the center part of the country as a trough tries to build into the Pacific Northwest. Our temperature are easily going to move back up into the mid to upper 70s, probably low 80s across western Nebraska under very dry conditions, perfect for harvest activity. We see a little bit of a zonal flow as that ridge breaks down somewhat with some energy moving across the Canadian border. There's surface low shown in northeastern Nebraska, but again, we have that dry air coming over the Rockies. There's just no moisture to work with, so we may see a few clouds, but that's about the extent of it. We go further in time, which takes us basically uh, from next Thursday through the following uh, Tuesday, we're looking at above normal temperatures that high pressure remains in place and unfortunately for precipitation there's just nothing in sight. Now from the model standpoint as we get out to the middle of the month once again the GFS model is still pointing toward a storm system in the center part of the country so hopefully that will answer some of our prayers in terms of precipitation. So Troy overall after this hard freeze it looks like we're going to see some Indian summer conditions. The next big opportunity for major precipitation is about the mid-month period. GFS has been really consistent on that. So let's pray that once for once, we will start to see a decent amount of moisture come into the state. Otherwise, it still looks like good harvest activity for the next 10 days. Thanks, Al. 
Finally today, it can be hard to keep up with the ever-changing world of technology. Luckily though, there's a new podcast to help farmers stay up to date in today's tech. It's called Farm Bits. So the Farm Bits podcast is a new podcast that is a product of the Nebraska Extension Digital Agriculture team. Uh, and essentially what the podcast is, is it is going to be a, a weekly offering from us that is going to provide some information about a particular digital agriculture technology pertaining to some event during the course of the agricultural uh, year. So this is just another avenue for us to go to reach producers in Nebraska. And I think digital agriculture is a spot that not a lot of people want to learn more about, but maybe don't know how to where to get started. So we hope we can kind of be that jump off point yeah. of where to kind of check things out and see how where we're at in digital technology on the farm. Uh, it's released every Thursday, and so we're going to start October 1st. And it's on uh, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, basically any podcast app. We also have a YouTube channel, so if that's a little bit easier to find, um, go check us out there. Absolutely. And if you search Farm Bits Podcast on YouTube, we will actually have a video there mm -hmm. that will kind of provide a tutorial for people who are not familiar with how to access a podcast on their iPhone or Android uh, that should be able to provide some assistance if that's how people want to listen to the podcast. Uh, and so we just feel like this is a great opportunity for producers to have the chance to learn about some technologies that may not necessarily be the easiest to understand uh, in a way that's, uh, that's also very considerate of their time demands. Check us out. Yeah. We're super excited about this. If anybody has any suggestions for content they want to hear about, mm -hmm. uh, if, if there's a subject we're not covering or if there's you know, something more that we could be doing, another perspective we could add, we'd love to hear from people about that. So whether it's in reviews on podcast platforms uh, or at our email that's usually listed in the show notes, um, those are great ways to contact us and we'd, we'd love to get feedback. Like Samantha said, the podcast just debuted. You can find more on the Market Journal website. That's going to do it for this week's show. Don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.